sort of messed up the statics part of it. So we'll talk about this problem and then do another one that has to do with it and then uh, see what we need for it, uh, for what's coming up. So we had this support structure of some kind and uh, And then this was a point in 16 inches, right? And there were a couple loads. The top load was 75 down, 75 kip. And then we had some kind of load up there, which was what, 45 and then 30 at the bottom in those directions. Right? And you were to figure out the displacement of this bottom point. I think I called it D. And the, the part that we hadn't gotten to that um, was in chapter 4 and really wasn't 4 fair to expect for this exam. However, when you see it, it you know, I hope that kind of will kind of make sense anyway. And most of you were approaching it anyway. It's the sum of any individual displacements that there might be. The fact that these different sections are under different forces. Some parts are under compression, some are under tension, and it's the uh, addition of all those different displacements across the thing that's going to give us the total displacement. And we figure it out in the same way we would have figured out an individual one. We just then have to add it all together. So, uh, for each individual section, you just need to figure out what's the force in that section, what's the length of that, and uh, we do have an area change. However, it was all the same material. Uh, yeah, and we even said it was A36 steel. So that was the, this, this simple concept, which uh, is, is, is kind of a no-brainer, and I think everybody was skirting on it anyway. Um, is technically in our book a chapter four topic, topic rather than a chapter one, two, or three topic. A chapter four, yeah, chapter four topic. So that's the part that really should not have been on the exam and, and I had no business putting it on there. So for that I apologize, for that we're talking about a possible solution. Um, we've already voted unanimously not to press charges with the administration. I thank you for that. And we did do that formal Wait, vote. We got the tape on that. Now it is, yeah. <laughs> Bob, you had a hand up? No? <laughs> TJ, did you have a hand up that had a green plaid shirt on it? Yeah. I swear. <laughs> All right. But, but the, uh, the part that where most everybody messed up anyway, and I don't know that it's fair you messed up there, was simply the statics. What are the forces in each of these pieces? Because there's, there's uh, three different sections that have different loads in them. And it's those three sections that you're going to sum up. So you need to know the force in each one of those sections. The length, that's pretty simple. That's sort of straight off of there. The area, too, I just gave you that. I didn't even give you the radius and make you calculate the area, which after grading the exam, I found out would have tricked a couple of you because uh, we're, we're still working on uh, the area of the circle. 
So uh, we need to find out the loads in each one of those pieces. So to do it, let's imagine a cut here somewhere just above this section. Somewhere up in here somewhere. So here's our dividing line. This is section two. Because this is going to give us whatever load is in that section that I happen to have labeled one. And that will pertain all the way to the tippy top where you would see the reaction force. Because it's going to have to be the same force um, all the way in there. Because anywhere along here, none of the load below that changes. So we have uh, we have the the 75 down, the 45 up, and the 30 down. So P1 must be then uh, 75 minus 45 plus 30, which is 60. And that's the same as would be the reaction at the very top. But we don't necessarily want the reaction. We want the force in this piece to determine is it being stretched? Is it being compressed? And by how much? So now we have P1, 60 kip. Its length is the 12 inches. And I, I, think, I think only one person put 12 with a little tick mark. Be careful of that kind of stuff, because then that looks like 12 to the 11th inside a, an equation. So don't set traps like that for yourself or for other people who might have to look at your work, which will happen in businesses. Your work is not a secret that you keep locked up necessarily. Something you sometimes have to share. And then E, well actually E comes out of the whole summation, so we'll just do that once. Which was what, 29? Yeah, 29 times 10 is 6. So that's pounds per square inch. So we got to watch that we had kips there. But, okay. So that's that with this E is the change in length of that first section. <clears throat> and since we know it to be in tension, we know that's going to be positive, it's going to be in the elongation. Then you have to add to that what happens here in this second section. But to do that, we need to know what the force is in the second section. So now we make a cut a little bit lower. Because there's some force there. We don't know what in that second section due to this 45 load. We know its direction. And we know the 30 down there. Those are all kips. So P2 must be... Yeah, I got it clearly now that we see those two things. I've got it in the wrong direction. But that's okay because we need to know what it is. And in fact, in this equation then... Uh, we know that's in compression, so we can either just put the minus sign in there or leave it as plus and put the minus on the force. It doesn't matter. It's going to be the same thing anyway. 15 kip. This length is also 12 inches, and its area 
is the same, 0.09. Or sorry, 0.9. And then that has the E underneath. So that piece is now del 2. And it's a minus because that section's in compression and will then shrink a little bit. So this piece will grow a little bit, this piece will shrink a little bit, and those two will, will sort of counteract each other. And then the last piece, put an imaginary cut in there to figure out the load. in that last piece. And that's uh, clearly in tension, uh, a tension of 30. So we have plus 30. Its length was 16. Its area is less, what was it, 0.3? Yeah, 0.3 square inches. So then the only thing other we have to do is watch out because we have kips here inches here, so uh, one kip is a thousand pounds. Kind of a mess on the board here, squeezing it all in. I think it's fair to expect you to have gotten those, and I don't know that, that anybody really did. This uh, was from chapter 4, even though it's kind of obvious when you see it, isn't it? I think. I hope. So, uh, so this, this, uh, this problem is kind of half a clinker. So, for those of you that wandered in, we're trying to decide what to do about that. The uh, one possibility is do that problem again. Either give you a take home and you do it, or we take class time to do it. Uh, another possibility was uh, change the points. These were 20 point questions, uh, two 20 point questions. So, for example, if you got a 35 out of 40, that's about an 88%. I can make them into two 30-point questions and leave everything else the same. Then it becomes a 55 out of 60, which is about a 92% if I remember the numbers. So I could do that, just 20 points on everybody's ratio, top and bottom. Drive the math teachers nuts, because what more fun is that than fractions. That do that. That is so much simpler. Notice that's off screen. <laughs> so now everybody who ever watches that video is going to go, oh, what did he do? I'd love to know. <laughs> See, it's fun to write stuff like it. I mean, you, you go to my Math 108 class I have to teach once in a while, they'll look at that and go, yeah, what's wrong? <laughs> you guys are... Your skin's crawling, I can tell the absurd nature of that, but that's our advantage. So that's also one possibility. Um, then, I don't know, maybe there's other possibilities you can come up with. And we don't have to decide right now. You can think about it. You can email each other over the weekend if you want. Say, I don't know, let's go ahead and press charges. For one time in our life, we have a case. We've got a nail. And I'm not going to explain the whole story to Brandon. Huh? What up? Press charges? Yeah. Yeah, but we already have on tape that you're not going to. So anyway, you want to just stew over it for the weekend? Is it possible to have a take home question and then take the higher of the two? So sure. if, if by chance you don't know. Sure. That's a that's certainly a possibility. Let's do uh, <coughs> Okay. So I I'll what I can do is uh, 
Uh, is that the general consensus? I don't want to go on a couple nodding heads when others are going, no, 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 there, I'm there. Like the higher of the two, like you'll take this one or the yeah. 20? No, no, the, the first first problem stands because there's nothing wrong with that. Right. First problem is a legitimate problem and no. your score on it's legitimate. It's second problem we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I can give you another second problem that'll have to do with deformation and you can do it as take home, and then uh, I'll take whichever of those is the higher. Oh, it's gonna be the same amount of points. Like yeah, points. yeah, it's, it's got to it's got to be something I can actually do. It's gonna be from chapter four or chapter eight, maybe. Or <laughs> <laughs> I know I do kind of like this. I feel like we're doing advanced work here Careful. this way by, by <laughs> stealthily zipping into the other chapters. No, I'll try to keep it to chapter three. Did we get it right? Uh, no, not all the way right. And the, the, there's there were two parts to it. There was the statics part, and then the mechanics and materials part. And everybody messed up the statics part, I think. So, so I'm not totally without grounds. All right. So I, I take home, and I replay, and I take the higher of. Problem two. Twenty point take home, the higher the either two. So should we should we vote? Wanna put your heads down on your desk and vote? <laughs> Do we not something else? So put our heads down Alright, the general can Colin, you okay with that? Jake? Okay. Uh, and what I'll do is, uh, is I'll put that on Angel over the weekend. Either tonight or tomorrow morning or something, I'll come up with a problem, I'll post it there, and then you guys can do it. And no reason not for Monday, I guess, because it was a, uh, shouldn't be more than a half an hour legitimately, because it was a half hour problem. Maybe a little bit more because you have take home. Right, wait, Monday to post it? Uh, as soon as I get it, this afternoon or tomorrow morning. But I'll send you an email that it's there. Okay, everybody can live with that. Uh, and I will need these back because I don't know what you got on the second one. So you got to give me these ones back as well. And you can either do it now or on Monday. But I will need those ones back. All right. Well, I'm so glad we're still friends. All right. So let's uh, let's see if you can actually do this. Now I don't have to instruct on it because I already did. We will need this for the rest of the business that's coming up that'll, that'll uh, take us through most of the rest of chapter four. Chapter four is a quick one, not too much to it. In fact, we'll finish chapter four on Monday. Uh, but we do need this, this idea. So I'll give you another one. You can figure it out. Two meter piece there in length. Area point oh oh one square meter, yep. Then some other piece to it, one meter in length, but twice the area. And then a meter and a half of the original piece. So it could be some kind of uh, some kind of uh, axial bearing uh, shaft of some kind. So that's the piece you got there, and it's loaded in this way. 
100 kilonewtons there. 250 there and 200 kilonewtons there in those directions. Structural A36 steel, same thing we just used. You need to find then the total change in length from from A to D all the way from the start down to the end of this. So very much the same problem we just had. Now that we know how to do it. Sorry? Oh, of course it is. This is a statics class. Because those forces clearly don't balance, and in this class, things always always are statically in static equilibrium. So yeah, it's it's fixed at N D somehow. doing, give or take a little bit, but one more smarter. Our, our anger is subsided. We called our father the lawyer and told him to drop all charges. Not to call for your cell phone. Call your dad. Daddy. Same thing we were doing before. You have to sum up all of the PL over AE. And notice we could we could make them of different uh, different materials, a, a particular section of a different material wouldn't be any problem. It's all the same material though, then, then E just comes out of that summation. That's called Professor Hanker. Let us see the answer. By the way, the the, uh, the the dynamics exam. Now that one is legitimate. I double check that one. Uh, if you want to start earlier, you can. It's just it's not till 9:30. I have to go serve a sentence in the math lab, and I'll be back at 9:30, and then you can start if you want. Where is the math lab? Uh, you have to. 15 minutes. It takes me 7 minutes to walk over and 7 minutes to walk back for 15 minutes over there. And when I get there, there's two other tutors already on duty. So, but it's, it, it's a contractual obligation I have to put in 15 hours of, of contact time a, a term. Even though I do more than that in the fall, it doesn't carry over. We're all 
doing the same problem, so I want to check as you go along, you're getting the same loads in each piece. There's a load in each of the three sections. It changes them for the two parts, or the three parts. centerpiece yeah. all by itself but then it's not in static equilibrium the forces aren't balanced then forces are always balanced in this class remember it's it's been true all last fall and, and several times last fall I told you that that's we needed to keep that for what we're doing in this class that everything is always in static equilibrium in this class. Several schools run the two together, statics and mechanics and materials, as a single four-hour class. We choose to do it as two three-hour classes. Gives us more time with the mistakes. to any part thereof. But anywhere you put an imaginary cut through the material, remember there are internal forces. And those are the things we're worried about in this class because those are the things that cause the deformation.
Morrison piece one? No. If you were to cut all the way by the So piece three? Yeah, I'll use it backwards. Well, that's okay. Yeah, I got 50,000 kilonewtons there. And then uh, B, it's 150,000. Uh-huh. And this is 100,000. No, 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 wait. No, no, this isn't right. No. No. Because it's length. It's 1.5 mil uh, meters. You only have one meter down there. For the, for the middle piece. Yeah, but the middle piece doesn't have the 50,000 kilonewtons you just put. Oh, that's up there. Well, no, 50 here. You now know the force in this piece to be 50,000 kilonewtons. Or newtons. Oh, okay. Yeah, you Oh, all right, I see. All right. Uh, now, don't. Don't just label these as the, for example, don't just say del C, because that doesn't make any sense. What happens to point C depends upon what's happening over here and here and here. So put it as a region. You can either do del 1 or del A, B, but don't just label it as a single point unless you're taking into account everything that's happened because it all comes into play. Well, maybe not since, since we do consider this fixed and immovable, then I guess by definition del D is zero because it's fixed to the rigid support. you got the internal forces the same. No sense going farther than that if those are all wrong. We've got P1, P2, and P3 to come up with. Or PAB, BC, and CD if you'd rather. It's only got that 100 kilonewton load on it. So. Okay. 
10,000 newtons. Its length is 2 meters. Area. Oh yeah, 100 kilometers, right. And then um, the E for A36 steel. We just had that, right? Yeah, we had it in English units. We need it in SI units, so be careful of that. 200 times 10 to the 7. Am I reading that number right? No, 10 to the 9. Pascals, newtons per square meter. So the units work out. This will be a deformation in meters. And that'll be positive because it gets longer. That section gets longer, actually. Yeah? Bobby, you got that? I got that part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Then go until something changes, in ter at least in terms of the load. We don't have any change in load until we get here to B, so we'll go into the next section. Imaginary internal cut with whatever external loads there are so that we can find out what the internal load is that must oppose it. So P2 must be in that direction and is 150 kilometers. Agreed? Now, now you agree, Bobby? No, I do. Yeah. So you can do the same thing. The change in length of piece two, or if you'd rather BC, whatever notation you choose is fine. So that's the load in two, the length in two, the area of two, and they all have the same uh, material. Though notice they don't need to. We could we could change that there if we if we wanted to. If uh, this was a different type of material in there, and so we have all those numbers as long as you're careful with the right ones. This piece is in compression. So um, probably our, our original convention was that then that's negative. All the same units. Get the right length though, one meter. Get the right area. And E is the same for each piece. We've already checked the units. Units are the same as up here. Is that right? Everything in there is okay? And so the center section, we have a negative in here for compression. Center section actually decreases by 375 micrometers. Frank, okay, you got that? Uh, I did it all once. You did it all? Oh, didn't. Yeah. Added all these up at once. Yeah. Okay. And then we go to the next piece. And figure out what the forces are in there. Each 
part, any part, has to also be in static equilibrium. And what'd you get for P3? 50,000. 50, 50 kilonewtons. And then putting all the numbers in, you should have gotten, I believe, just the opposite of that, didn't you? Leaving the total definitions up there. Just coincidence, there's no guarantee that kind of thing would happen, just the way the numbers shook out, because it depends on the area, the load, and the length. Okay, Brandon? Make sense? Colin, all right? Okay. Brandon, you got it all? Yep. All right. Whatever these internal forces are and whatever these deformations are, we can use these now to solve what are called statically indeterminate problems. In fact, we've already looked at one. Statically indeterminate problems. We've already looked at one and we've been sort of hinting around them even since all last fall. If you remember, every time we did some kind of beam problem, simply supported beam, I always put some kind of roller thing under one end. The reason being, if we didn't, We, we can solve that problem. If we didn't do that, if we did it more like you'd imagine we actually do these type of things, and of course there's got to be some kind of load on here, whatever it is. If we did that type of thing, then We have the reactions to those loads, and I guess we'd need uh, we'd need some some kind of component of uh, a horizontal load here just to make the the problem actually work out in its entirety. If we knew what these loads were and the lengths and all those other type of things we need. If I didn't have the rollers in there, we have a problem with how many unknowns? We have four unknowns here because we got uh, a reaction, a full reaction at each side But we only have three equations available. That's why we had to put the roller in here. Because otherwise we have too many unknowns for the number of equations available. And those problems are statically indeterminate. Meaning we cannot, using our normal statics, determine what the reactions are. So we can solve statically indeterminate problems now using the deformation. In fact, we've already done it once. We had a problem uh, last week, I believe, where we had this beam 
remember with two different length legs and once loaded it had to remain horizontal and to solve that then we used the fact that the deformation of the two legs had to be the same so we had to take into account the the area of those, the length of those, the material of those, and adjust the load accordingly so that each side deformed by the same amount. Originally this problem was statically indeterminate. We were able to solve it using now the deformation um, ideas that we didn't have last fall. So, I'll give you a, a problem as a bit of a warm-up, and then we'll continue with it on, uh, on Monday. So, imagine we've got some kind of support piece here that is actually made up of two materials. inside the other. So if we look at it on end, it's actually two materials. One an outer tube and one an inner rod. Uh, they don't necessarily have to touch, it's just uh, easier to draw it that way. Um, we're, we're not considering any of the adhesives or bondings or any of those type of things now. And then we imagine it loaded with, uh, maybe there's some kind of cap here then uh, upon which we, we impart a load. That cap we're considering kind of like our supports. It's rigid, undeformable, plays no piece in the problem we're having. All that does for us is distributes the load evenly over the two things. So this problem we do in, uh, well, we do it the way we do anything else, I guess. we. We look at a free body diagram of the two objects. There's the tube and there's the rod. And we even have the cap there because everything's got to be in static equilibrium. There's our, our original load, maybe we'll call it in a bit of creativity, we'll call it P. And P gets distributed partly onto that piece and partly onto this piece. We don't normally draw the loads as distributed, but we kind of have to just because of that, that tube thing there. Um, but I guess we could, we could reduce it to looking at the cap in most simple terms. The cap is going to be pushing on the tube and the rod, and those are going to then be pushing back. So there's some load in that tube and some load taken by the rod. As the cap pushes on them, they push back on the cap and we need to find out what those are. So that's PR for load on the rod is PT.
using statics, we only have one equation. P equals PT plus PR. The total load must be partly taken by the tube and partly taken by the rod. And last fall, that's where we would have been stuck. Now, however, we can add another equation in that the deformation of the tube must equal that of the rod. However much the rod gets compressed, the tube's got to get compressed the same amount. Otherwise, a, some kind of gap would form in here between the cap and the tube and the rod themselves, and that doesn't make any sense. Couldn't push on that and have one of them shrink farther away until it's no longer even in contact. Yep? Even, even if they're different material, they have, the dell has to be the same. Has to, yeah. Because otherwise, if we press on this, and the tube shrinks a little bit, um, if that del wasn't the same, say that the del of the rod was a little bit more, now the rod's down here, no longer in contact, well how would that happen? Right, right. There's nothing to force it down to there. Cause, so they can only, they can only go to the same length, otherwise one of them loses contact with the forces that are causing that. All right, so we, we have a second equation then now. So we have two equations now, two unknowns. Those equations don't involve anything more than the geometry, the area, the length, the material. And each of them involves the forces, so we're not really introducing any new unknowns. All right, so that's, that's one way of looking at static indeterminacy. And we'll do another method on Monday. So leave with me these exams if you want. I need them for reference when you do the new problem. I'll post that and send an email when it's ready. Um, and also the dynamics guys, if you want to take, start the test at 9.30, you're welcome to. Still get an hour 20. But if you want to start early, you can. <laughs>